Hi, I'm Matt Lupoli, and welcome to Percussion 101 with Mr. Lupoli. Hey guys, Mr. Lupoli here, and welcome to Percussion 101 with Mr. Lupoli. On this episode, we'll be talking all about the drum kit, also known as the drum set or the trap kit. So most of you might know that percussion instruments are very old, probably the oldest instrument family in the world with many percussion instruments dating back to ancient times. Um, so there are so many different styles of music where percussion has been featured for, for hundreds, even thousands of years. Now, my students have been using a lot of snare drums and bass drums in their concert settings. And usually when people think of percussion, that's what most people think of. Drums, snare drums, bass drums, and so forth. But for many years, instruments like the snare drum and the bass drum, they were strictly military instruments. Meaning that in times of battle, armies would take drummer boys with them. So they would have people with slings wearing marching snare drums and marching bass drums to play um, percussion music just to give the army a sense of beat, a sense of rhythm, so they would know uh, what speed to march in and so forth, and different calls that would tell them to do different things. But in orchestral and concert settings, usually the only percussion that you would see would be the timpani, also known as kettle drums, and you might even see some crash cymbals, and various types of mallet percussion. Snare drums and bass drums didn't arrive in orchestral settings until around the 1800s. And for many years, you would have one percussionist assigned to each instrument. So for example, if you had a piece of music that called for snare drum, bass drum, and triangle, you would have three percussionists for those parts, one on the snare, one on the bass, and one on the triangle. But after many years, percussionists started to experiment with new types of hardware and new t types of contraptions and whatnot to see if perhaps one percussionist can play it all. Um, so some percussionists started developing various types of foot pedals, and before we knew it, the drum kit was invented. And at first, it was referred to as the trap kit. Trap was a shortened version of the word contraption. That's what it was. It was a percussion contraption. Uh, but for many decades, drum sets did not look the way that they did now. No, they were very strange looking. Essentially, the bass drum that you would see in a drum kit was no different than a concert bass drum. It was a very large bass drum that would have other items mounted on it. So they had various like things like cowbells and temple blocks, little sound effects. There would be a tiny little snare drum, maybe a cymbal. And you had tom-toms, but they were very different than the tom-toms that you would see today. We'll talk more about that later on. Um, and then drums as we kind of know them today, those started to get popular in the early 1900s with the advent of jazz music. And then we started to have uh, big band drummers like Gene Krupa, who worked closely with major drum companies to kind of develop the drums and other various drum kit products that we now see today. Now, I first started playing the drum kit when I was about 14 years old, and uh, when that first happened, in addition to learning how to play the instrument, I also uh, studied the various drum manufacturers that were around in the market today. Uh, so the very first kit I played on was my dad's 1968 Gretsch drum kit. Uh, my dad had studied drums when he was a young man too, and uh, I sort of inherited his first kit. 
Uh, it was a beautiful five-piece kit in a champagne sparkle finish. Uh, that's another thing I love about these drum kits is that they come in so many different colors and shades and finishes, but I love this uh, champagne sparkle kit. It's very, almost has like a royal kind of look to it. I, I love it. Um, now, you notice that when I refer to it, I refer to it as a, a five-piece kit, and when you say that, like, oh, I play on a, a four-piece kit or I play on a 10-piece kit or whatever, you're just referring to the drums themselves. You're not counting any of the cymbals or anything else. So if you say I have a five-piece kit, that means you have five drums in your kit and you might have five cymbals too, but you don't include those. Uh, now, this Gretsch kit was great when I first started uh, learning how to play on it. But after a while, I didn't really want to plan it anymore, only because it was so old and it was in great condition, and I was playing on the road a lot more, and I would have been devastated if, if it had gotten damaged at all. So I decided that uh, I was going to retire that kit. I didn't want to play it anymore. I, I just had it on display. Uh, so I started looking around to get uh, a newer kit that I wouldn't be so devastated if maybe it got a couple of dings in it and so forth. Uh, so I searched around some of the other drum companies, and one company I kept coming to was called DW, which is short for Drum Workshop. And I watched a video about how they make their drums and a view inside of their factory, and I was really impressed with the quality that they put into their work um, and all of the, the timbre matching and the wood matching, and they just made a science. Like, you know, they had guys at their company that would study wood and the sound qualities of that wood to make it really resonate when they played on their drums and I was just completely sold. So I uh, had my local drum dealer call DW and they designed a custom kit for me and I basically made it look the same as my dad's old Gretsch kit. It was the same color, the same dimensions, you know, champagne sparkle. So it was sort of a tribute to my dad's kit. And uh, this DW kit, I've been playing it now for almost 20 years. I love it. It's my baby. And uh, DW is a fantastic company. I, a couple times I've even met the, uh, the two owners at various drum shows, and they're fantastic guys, and I love them. I, I think I'll continue to play DW for quite some time. But in addition to companies like DW and Gretsch, there are some other fantastic companies out there as well, uh, such as Ludwig. Slingerland, Tama, Pearl, Sonar, and even Yamaha is in the drum business. All right, so now we're back here where the magic happens, and we're going to talk a little bit about what all the various drums, cymbals, and sound effects are that go into a drum kit. Okay, first right here, it's something very important. This is the drum throne, which is the seat that a drum set player will be sitting on. So when you are picking out a drum throne, make sure you pick out one that's very comfortable and that's easy on your back because you have to remember, you're going to be sitting in this for quite some time. So you don't want to sit in anything that's going to be uncomfortable or it's going to give you any back problems. And this guy, nice and cushiony, and I can play on this guy for hours. It's a fantastic um, drum throne, and it's made by the Rock and Sock Company. Now over here, let's start with this guy. So this is a drum that many of my students have seen before. This is a snare drum, just like you would see in a concert setting. But specifically, this is a drum set or a drum kit snare drum. Um, so it is a lot thinner than uh, a snare drum that you would see in a marching band setting. It's a little bit more um, in line with one that you would see in a concert band setting. So this, it's about uh, five and a half inches on the shell. And just like any other snare drum, we have the snare leather over here. which goes up and down, and that's going to change the snares. All right, so here's an underside view so we can see more of what I was talking about. So I was saying that this is a snare drum, and I was talking about the lever that uh, either raises or lowers the snares. These are the snares, so that's what gives it its signature sound. 
Um, and also on the underside, we can actually see into the drum. We can actually see it's a wood shell. See DW, they put a great quality in their shells. And we even see a little signature right there. That's the signature of Johnny Craviato. So Johnny Craviato is a master snare drum maker and he just so happens to make snare drums uh, for DW. And when I heard about this, I specifically requested a, um, a Johnny Craviato snare. I said, I wanna make sure that he makes my snare drum um, because his snare drums sound fantastic and you know, he signs everyone when he's done with it and someday, you know, years from now after he passes away, his snare drums are gonna be worth a lot of money. They're very unique instruments. All right, and I just wanted to give everybody a little sound test. Here's what the snare drum sounds like with the snares on. Get that really high pitched like pop sound. And now I'm gonna turn this lever. And now we're gonna hear it with the sound, oh, with the snares off. All right, and sometimes in music, it'll actually say that, uh, sheet music, it'll say turn snares off. A lot of times in Latin styled pieces, they ask for the snares off to get more of that hand drum kind of sound. All right, so here's the back side of the bass drum, which we saw from the front before with the big DW letters. Um, so this is the view that you would get if you're actually sitting in the drum kit. Um, and you notice there's some foot pedals below. Uh, and that's why a nickname for a drum set bass drum is the kick drum, because you actually use your foot to play it. So I'm gonna put my foot right there. All right, and some of you might have also noticed that it looks like there's two mallets right there. That's because I have what's called a double bass drum pedal. So I have one foot here, and I have one foot over here as well. Now, that's because in the 1950s, it was made popular to use two bass drums. This was originally made popular by the jazz drummer, Louis Belson. He claims to be the first person to do that, uh, to put two bass drums together. And he kind of argued that now, whatever you do with your hands, you can now do with your feet. But it really, the popularity of this didn't really take off until the late 1960s. And that was because the drummer Ginger Baker, who was best known as the drummer of Cream, he used two bass drums. And uh, that was a very popular band and he was a very popular drummer. And suddenly a lot of drummers were using two bass drums. And we see that a lot throughout the 1970s and the 1980s. But starting in the 1990s, we started to see less and less people using two bass drums, and that's because the double bass drum pedal was invented. It's very difficult to tune two bass drums to sound exactly the same. It takes a lot of time, but somebody figured out that if you use a double bass drum pedal, it's just two mallets on the same one bass drum. So now you don't have to worry about using two bass drums anymore. You can just tune one bass drum the way you like it and with a double pedal, um, it'll all sound the same. Here's a little, uh, I'm gonna experiment a little bit. Here's a little demonstration. All right, so these other three drums that we see in the kit, these are called Tom Tom drums. Um, so tom-toms have their origin in types of Chinese drums. Uh, when drummers first started putting drum kits together in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, tom-toms were just these very small shell drums that would have a, uh, an animal skin tacked on. They were not tunable. But uh, one of the first big band drummers to really uh, make drums popular was Gene Krupa, and he worked closely with... Uh, drum companies, I believe it was the Slingeland Company, to come up with the idea for a tunable tom-tom, like the ones that we see now here. And we see that we have uh, rims and lugs and uh, tuning pegs and all kinds of things to adjust your drum. So what are the differences between these various tom-toms? Well, these two that you see that are mounted onto the bass drum, we call those rack toms because they are actually mounted on a rack that's on top of the bass drum. We'll test these guys out. And notice 
that they have two different pitches because of the two different sizes. And then this bigger guy that's down here is a floor tom because as you guessed it, this guy is on the floor. He's not mounted on the rack. He stands on his own with his own uh, three legs that have been adjusted. You can adjust the height however way you like it. All right. Now, sometimes uh, if I'm playing jazz music, I might remove the second rack tom, the one on the, uh, on the right over here. And then if I'm playing rock music, I'll put it back on. Usually in jazz music, you won't need that extra drum. It depends on what you're playing exactly. But, um, but I will do that from time to time. I'll remove the right rack tom. And other types of tom-toms that I don't have here are the roto-toms, tube toms, and the gong bass drum. And even though it's called a gong bass drum, it's actually a type of tom tom it is basically a very large open-ended floor tom all right and here's one last drum i want to show you this is actually another kind of snare drum but this one's called a piccolo snare drum piccolo is the italian word for small and as you can see it is a very small snare drum it's very thin much thinner than my uh, regular snare drum and the reason why you would have this is because since it's so small and thin it has a very high-pitched sound you get a nice sort of pop. So um, this is usually thought of as sort of like a special effects drum. I don't use it all the time, uh, but I use it for certain kinds of special effects. And uh, just for like humorous musical situations, I'll use this guy. Um, but most of the time, I'll just use my regular uh, five and a half inch snare drum. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the cymbals now. Um, so drums as we know them today, um, kind of evolved from types of log drums that were in Africa. But cymbals, as we know them today, are evolved from types of cymbals that we saw in Turkey and other parts of the Middle East. Uh, so you'll probably notice that all of my cymbals have this word on them, Zildjian. Uh, Zildjian is a very old cymbal manufacturing company. Um, they're actually originally based in the 1600s in Turkey. Um, there was an Armenian man who lived in Turkey who made um, symbols um, actually by accident. He was an alchemist and he was trying to find out how to turn base metals into gold. And instead he invented a metal that had amazing musical qualities that didn't break. It didn't like uh, break like glass. It's, you know, it was very tough. Uh, so he showed them to the Sultan of Turkey who was very impressed with them. So he said, what are you called? And he said, oh, my name is Avedis. And he said, what is your family name? And he said, I don't have one. Um, so he gave the man the name Zildjian, which is Turkish for symbol maker. And after many years of making Zildjian symbols in Turkey, eventually the family came over to the United States. And um, they are now based just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and they have a, a great factory the factory is not open to the general public, but when I was in college, uh, my professor, who's a Zildjian performing artist, he was invited to go tour the factory with all of his students, and that included me. And uh, we got to see how symbols were made, and it was amazing. I felt like I was at Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, except it was symbols instead of chocolate. Um, so we have different kinds of symbols here that are made by Zildjian. So if you can only have one kind of symbol, it would have to be this guy right here. So this is, and yes, it's actually two symbols. There's one on top of the other. These are called the hi-hat symbols. And hi-hat symbols are evolved um, from the crash symbols that you see in marching band and orchestral settings. They work together as a pair. And it is operated with a foot pedal, just like we saw with the bass drum. So it's a great symbol because it helps you keep time, helps you keep the beat, so to speak, with your left foot. And you can do great things with it with a stick. Yeah, 
So it's great for time keeping, great for groove keeping. So yeah, if there's only one symbol or one set of symbols that you can have, it would have to be the hi-hat. Every drummer should start out with the hi-hat. All right, so this big guy on my right side, this is another very important symbol. Um, if there were only two symbols you could have, it would be the set of hi-hats and this one. This is called the ride symbol. Um, so not only is this important for uh, rock and roll drumming, but it's also very important for blues and especially for jazz drumming. So that's what we call riding. So it's just like on the hi-hat, I was kind of keeping time, grooving on it and so forth. Uh, dr jazz drummers will probably collect several different types of ride cymbals. It's not unusual for them to have maybe three or four different ride cymbals on display all at the same time. I usually will just have one or two ride cymbals on display at one time, and I have others that I have uh, kept away right now. This particular one is called a ping ride because it has a very like ping kind of quality, a very kind of like high little pop kind of pitch to it. Um, and I use this a lot when I'm playing rock music. But if I'm going to play more like jazz style music, I will probably switch this one out for what's called my medium ride that has more of a swing kind of jazz sound to it. All right. And this is the third of the uh, basic kinds of symbols that you will see in any drum kit. This is called the crash symbol. So those are the kind of the three main categories of symbols, hi-hats, ride symbols, and crash symbols. So the crash is called that because you have that very explosive kind of sound that goes to it, a very, very kind of crashy kind of sound. So uh, crash symbols are kind of to rock drummers what, uh, what ride symbols are to jazz drummers. I mentioned before that ride symbols, you'll find a lot of them with jazz drummers. They might have several on display. Well, rock drummers will probably have several different kinds of crash symbols. They might have three, four, even five kinds of crash symbols on display, all different sizes and different types. This particular one is called a thin crash. <laughs> All right, and then over here, this is actually another kind of crash symbol, believe it or not. Uh, this is actually called a splash symbol because it is such a small little crash one. It doesn't make the same kind of crash that the thin crash does. It makes a smaller kind of <laughs> splash. And I use that in a lot of little like uh, special effects and whatnot. And then this guy over here technically is a ride symbol, um, but I tend to use it more as a crash symbol. This is actually called a crash ride. So technically it is a ride symbol, but it has kind of a crashy quality to it. So you can use it as either one. You can use it as a ride symbol. Or you can use it as a crash symbol. All right, and this big guy over here, this is a kind of a special effects symbol. This is called a China symbol, or some people call it a China boy. Um, and it, it is a kind of uh, symbol that evolved from Chinese symbols. So this one is not Turkish or Middle Eastern in origin. This one is actually Chinese um, in origin. And a lot of people ask, why is it upside down? Well, that's the thing. These Chinese symbols, um, they actually are supposed to be mounted like this. They have that kind of upside down look. Whether it's a, a trash symbol or China boy or a swish symbol, they all are mounted like this. And notice it has a very like oriental kind of sound. Uh, this is not a symbol I use all the time. I will most likely not use this in jazz, mainly rock music. I use this for special effects. Um, and it has a funny story. I actually bought this at the Zildjian factory directly. As I mentioned before, uh, when I was in college, I went on a tour of the Zildjian factory. And at the end of the tour, they had the Zildjian symbol showroom where you could see symbols and try them out. And if there were any that you liked, uh, you could actually take them home with you. And um, I had wanted a China symbol for quite some time, but I could never f find one that I really liked. There was like a sound I had in my head that I was really uh, 
um, that I really wanted to get. And finally, I found it at the Zildjian factory. I found the symbol that I liked, and it sounded great. And I took it home, and I've had it with me ever since. And lastly, we have this guy over here. This is um, an instrument I'm sure most of you recognize. This is a gong. Uh, so a gong, unlike the other symbols, it is not Turkish in origin and actually is uh, East Asian. So you'll find gongs in places like China, Korea, and Japan. Um, they come in various sizes. Some are very large and some are very small. Now there's different kinds of gongs. Um, there's one kind called the nipple gong or the bell gong because in the center it actually pops out like a bell like you see in most of the drum set cymbals. And these gongs are usually pitched to a certain specific note. Um, then you have what are called tam-tams. A tam-tam is a flatter style gong. And then you have this kind. This is what we call a wind gong, which is a, a gong that a lot of rock drummers use, like myself. And uh, wind gongs are flat, as you can see, and they don't have any specific pitch. They're just used for kind of special effects. And you would not use this with regular drumsticks. You would uh, use this with a what's called a gong mallet, like the one we see here. So I'm gonna kind of warm it up first. Now, some of the other great symbol manufacturing companies out in the market today, other than Zildjian, also include Sabian, Pasty, and Meinl. All right, so the last part of this uh, drum set tour that I want to talk about are special effects. So these are other types of percussion instruments that drum kit players will usually add uh, to their drum kit for just kind of some extra sound effects, like usually for humorous effect and whatnot. Um, so over here we have something that some of you have probably seen before. A lot of people mistakenly call these wind chimes, but there are not wind chimes. Wind chimes are always arranged in a circular motion, and usually you'll find those outside somewhere. These are actually called bar chimes, or you can call it the Mark Tree because it was invented by a percussionist named Mark. All right, so we have that. And then we have what well, we see in a lot of types of Latin music and rock music. We have the cowbell. All right, then we have something that's related to the wood block, but this one's made out of plastic, so we call this a rock block. Then we have a little tambourine down here. Now, this is another kind of tambourine, but this one's called a jam tam because... Uh, that other tambourine you just heard me play, whenever you hit it, you get that kind of a hard plasticky sound in addition to the jingles. Well, the jam tam right here has a little rubber pad, so when you hit it, you get just the jingly sound. And you don't get that hard plastic kind of sound mixed in there with it. And uh, here we have another, this is called a hat trick tambourine. So you mount this right on top of the hi-hat cymbal. Get a little jingly effect when you're using your hi-hats. Um, these guys, this set, these are Chinese in origin. These are called temple blocks. And notice they are all different sizes, and because of that, you will get different pitches. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some basic drum set grooves. So, first of all, when I first started playing, it occurred to me right away that if you were gonna study drums, you were gonna study jazz, just because jazz is such a very drum-oriented style of music. And obviously, yes, there are types of jazz that do not feature any drums at all, but a lot of jazz music does feature drums. And there are different styles of jazz, and there's different types of jazz grooves that you'll perform on the drum kit. So let's start with the most basic one. That one's called the swing beat. And it goes a little something like this.
type you might find is called the shuffle beat. That's also one that you will find in blues as well. Now let's get into some of the Latin inspired jazz. So one is the bossa nova. type is referred to as the cha-cha or the cha-cha-cha. Then you also have what is called the rumba beat. different kinds of jazz grooves. There's so many different kinds that, and they, they have published so many different books of all the different grooves that you might play on the drum kit. So now if you're going to play any rock beats, here's your basic rock groove. All right, so that's your, just your basic rock groove. Now, uh, usually rock drummers will add what are called fills, and that's when you play different rudiments on the snare and all the other drums, like the tom-toms, and then usually end off with a crash. It's just to kind of fill in all that empty space. It goes a little something like this. talking a little bit about the bass drum, I was talking about the double bass drum pedal. So let's uh, hear a little rock groove with some double bass drum pedal action. Now there are two types of uh, drumstick grips that drummers use. So the original one is what we refer to as the traditional grip. And that's where the left hand is actually turned over with the palm facing up, the fingers go in between like this, close. And then the right hand, the hand is turned over with the top of the hand facing up. All right, so this is called the traditional grip because this was, uh, developed in the times when snare drum was strictly a military instrument and a drum would be worn on a sling that was wrapped around the chest and the drum would always be tilted over on an angle so because of that they had to develop this kind of like diagonal angle uh, sticking style um, and this is a grip that's used a lot in jazz music so I will tend to use this uh, when I'm playing jazz now the other way which is the way I first learned how is called the matched grip and this the left hand is made to look exactly like the right hand, matched. So this is used a lot in rock music. I will play this way, or if I'm playing um, like a concert snare drum, a lot of times I will play um, matched grip. So is one grip better than the other? No, I think they're both great grips. I don't think one grip is necessarily better than the other, 
Uh, but I do recommend that drummers learn both ways. All right, so another thing I wanted to talk about were the different kinds of drum sticks and other various drum utensils, so to speak. Um, so when I'm playing rock music, usually I will use this kind of drumstick. So notice the type of head we have here. So it's a much more like oval shaped kind of head as opposed to a very round head. So it gives it a better kind of rock sound. Then right here, now this is a little smaller, rounder sort of drum heads. This is a stick that I would use for jazz music. And then these other guys aren't really, they're not really uh, sticks at all, and that's why I kind of give them the name utensils. So this is called a drum brush. And I once had somebody ask me, like, oh, does that mean that you clean with it? No, it's actually an instrument. Um, it gives it a much um, softer, wiry kind of sound, but it is not used like a typical drum stick, just meant to be softer. It's a different kind of instrument, and I'll demonstrate that for you in just a bit. or something that were invented in more recent years. Um, it's not quite a stick and it's not quite a brush. It's what's called a hot rod. So it has kind of an in-between kind of sound. All right, so we have those. And then over here we have yarn mallets. And um, these are used um, if you want to have like a softer kind of sound on the drums and also we can do the little kind of a cymbal roll swish effect on cymbals and do some kind of like cool special effects. Now if you're really serious about playing the drum kit, here's a compilation of some of the greatest musicians to ever sit down at a drum kit for you to listen to. But you don't have to take my word for it.
Thanks again for joining us today. We'll see you next time on the next episode of Percussion 101 with Mr. Lupoli.